Her name is Rebecca Hui, and she is a Berkeley and MIT graduate who has worked with National Geographic, the US Department of State, and now is a CEO of her own company, Root Studio. And Root Studio partners with artists from remote corners of the globe to help digitize their work and their stories. So, Rebecca Hui. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for sticking around for this uh, last talk of the day. I will try and make it as uh, engaging and worth your time as possible. Um, so I, I started a social enterprise called Root Studio about three years ago. And we work with traditional and cultural artists around the world, generally in pretty remote places. And we digitize their designs into a cultural library that gets licensed by retailers. And we create a way for royalties to go back to these artists. So in some ways, it's bringing anthropology and culture preservation online with a very practical livelihood component to it. But um, before I get into all the nooks and crannies of how our business model works, um, I actually want to take a step back and talk about the story before the story of how I started building Roots. Um, how many of you guys are below the age of 20 here? OK, cool. <laughs> So that's actually when I when the seeds of Roots started, um, no pun intended. Um, <laughs> but I, I remember when I was 19, um, I was going to Berkeley. Um, I had all the right kind of roadmap laid out for me to go to a job in banking or consulting. Um, that's what all my friends were going to go intern for Morgan Stanley. This was before tech was big. Um, and I just remember feeling very lost, um, feeling like I was privileged, but not necessarily, this is not really the life that was meant for me. And I felt, uh, I felt strange about it because my parents had been refugees uh, from the Cultural Revolution and had made it all the way out to the States to get an undergraduate uh, degree and for me to basically take hold of this American dream. Um, but I found myself drifting elsewhere. I found myself, uh, I, I drew, I was a painter, I loved reading. And in a lot of my readings, I had read about things like uh, informal settlements, uh, urbanization, rural development, all these things I had no conception of. What is a village? What essentially is a slum? So the only way to find out what that was was to actually go to places like this. So when I was 19, uh, instead of taking on a summer internship in the States, uh, I booked a ticket to go to Ahmedabad in India. And I told my parents about a month in advance. They were not happy about it. But it was one of those things that any good parent would be not happy about. Um, so this is me. <laughs> and I, <laughs> I promise the cow has an important part of the story. Um, of course, coming into India, I was totally taken aback in so many ways. I didn't go with a program. I went on my own. And I started working for a local landscape architect. Um, amongst so many things that I was, um, I was learning and seeing, one of the things that fascinated me the most were these cows that just hung around in the cities. Um, these cows, they do whatever they want, they just sit in the middle of intersections, um, they eat whatever they want. And I was like, wow, how cool is it to be this non-human living in a human city um, and to have your own sense of free will? So I told myself for three hours every day, I'm going to pick the first cow I see on the street and follow it. And no matter what it does, if it's just going to chill there, I'm going to chill with this cow. Um, and I started following a ton of cows, cows in really urban areas, cows in more remote areas. Um, I started finding other animals in the streets that I got to follow, including elephants, camels, street dogs. Um, and, and this whole kind of cow following obsession turned into um, a three-year project called Life Through the Perspective of a Cow. Um, it, it was just this, it led me down this journey of wanting to know more and more what were these animals doing in these cities? Who did they come with? Uh, why were they there? Why were people putting flowers on them? Why were people, like, what were they eating every day? Um, and ultimately, uh, this project led me to uh, know so many of the, the caretakers of these cows and the people that it came with, and many of them were migrants. These cows and the chickens that were in the cities were often um, coming uh, from, from villagers who were coming into the city to find work. Um, and one of the fundamental questions I started having beyond just an observational perspective um, of this whole rural or urban uh, dynamic was, why were all these people flooding to the cities and often being in situations that 
weren't necessarily for them. They were often evicted in the places that were staying in, and people in the cities didn't really appreciate them. Uh, they were looked down upon, and they were often discriminated. Um, and in, in this kind of three-year period where I was following these animals, I was also asking myself, what is my role in all of this as a Chinese-American woman who had no ethnic ties to India but fell so deeply in love with all of the politics and, and things that were happening in India? And so I think this quote here uh, summarizes pretty well when we think about all the problems in the world and all the opportunities, how we should think of uh, our role in this situation. Um, it's long, but it's actually a very, it has like a very simple and terse point. I am only one, but still I am one. I cannot do everything, but still I can do something. And because I cannot do everything, I will not refuse to do the something I can do. <laughs> so super circuitous way to get to this point that, you know, if we are, if we are able to see uh, a potential or a solution towards a problem that's in front of us, um, why, why not act on it? in whatever capacity you can. You don't have to be from that place. You don't have to be necessarily from the background. But if you see a, a, a way and a will, do something about it. Um, so uh, three years later, I was, um, I was uh, in a lot of these communities working alongside and thinking about how do we essentially uh, bring, create ways so that people aren't leaving and abandoning their homes for the cities. And how do we, in some ways, uh, bring prosperity back to these villages? So the very first naive hunch I had was, well, one of the, the ways to bring prosperity back and aspirational goals is to uh, bring education back into to these rural communities. Um, and of course, like education is on one of the you know, top mandates of, of development. Uh, so I was like, OK, well, if education is a function of the fact that they need schools, and there's no schools in these remote areas, why don't we bring schools to them? Why don't we build a school on wheels so we took apart this bus and we started designing, um, we started designing a bus um, that was also a school that was flexible and reconfigurable. And the first prototype was in the shape of this wow. giant owl that looks kind of like an owl version of Cher, the pop singer, but <laughs> it looks ridiculous. Uh, <laughs> and owls were significant to the cluster of villages I was working with in West Bengal. Um, and it was called the Toto Express. And so we started piloting the school for about three months, and it was, I, I, I was, uh, it was some of the most interesting three months of my life. But I think towards the third month in, I started to realize that their parents start st stopped uh, sending their kids to this after-school program, and I was uh, talking to their parents about it. Hey, like, why are we seeing attrition with your kids? And they said, Well, I need my kid to work on the farm or on crafts after the school, the government school that they were going to already. And I said, well, isn't education important? And they're like, not when we live under $1,000 in annual household income, and even the most educated person in this village doesn't end up uh, being able to get a job in a nearby city in Calcutta. And I thought a lot about that. I think we think so much about education as the gateway and the, the door to better opportunities. But sometimes we just place this idea and this mentality that what we have out here in our 10-year idea of education is not transferable to so many people around the world, especially for rural areas. So instead, um, I looked towards what, uh, what skills that they had, and there were so many that were, uh, there were so many talents and so many skills and assets that don't actually exist in urban areas. One of them um, is craft making something that I could resonate with as an artist and designer myself. Um, and I, I would go in, in, in the evenings, and there were people who would be laying out canvases in front of me. And they were tractor drivers by day, or they were cement workers. And they wouldn't call themselves an artist because they weren't being paid for it. And I was like, this is so ridiculous. Like, you can draw and create this thing in a matter of an hour, and you're not being paid for it, but instead, you're driving a tractor around. So I started taking a lot of this art out of the villages, and I went to nearby cities in Mumbai or Delhi, and I started telling people, hey, like, how much would you pay this for? And I would not tell them it's from a village. I would not tell them where it's from. And some of them would be like, we would actually put together a whole gallery for this guy. And when I, when I uh, broke it to them that this guy has never left beyond 50 kilometers of a village in, say, central India, they were totally stunned. Because in their heads, they would have put uh, people coming from rural areas in this box of poverty and unable to help themselves. And it's, it's crazy. And I, th I think this picture is uh, a statue on top of one of the schools that I was uh, piloting with during Total Express that really captures some of this frustration 
that, that I saw. Um, it's, it's an image of something we're so familiar with. It's the evolution of man. Uh, we start as monkeys, and then we, we become bipedal, and we become upright. But the interesting thing about the statue is that there's another step, is that you go from upright man to hunched over a computer typing away, as if that's the next step of human evolution. <laughs> And I think it's super interesting because essentially, I mean, especially in a place like India, IT and tech is seen as the savior, and, so, and also in Silicon Valley. Um, but, but when I was in, in this community where this statue was found, there's not one computer in the entire village. Um, and, and their hand skills could be much, uh, they could produce these incredible art pieces in a matter of hour. Why should they be trying to learn how to code JavaScript? So instead, um, we, I, I started to wrap my entire idea around education, but in the function of creating prosperous villages. How do we formalize the skills and assets that exist in a village and use technology as an enabler, but not to say that technology should be imposed as the savior for these villages? And that's how Root Studio began. Um. <laughs> برش الحرب عام 2011 يعني حاولت أصمد بما في الكفاية يعني غادرت سوريا في عام 2014 أسكن في مخيم زاتري لا في هذه الفترة لا يمكن أن يتخطي فبدأت رسالة تكنولوجية لوصول فني إلى العالم سوريا مباشرة بس نبعث عن طريق الأمين فضح ووطن اللي يخبر الجميع فني أحب أن أخبر العالم أن كل الأوطان جميلة ولدت في طعام في الريف عاش عشت أيام حلوة كثير يعني من أيام الطفولة مارست هواية الرسم من صغر برش الحرب عام 2011 يعني حاولت أصمد بما في الكفاية يعني غادرت سوريا في عام 2014 أسكن في مخيم ساتر إلى في هذه الفترة لا يمكن أن يتخطي فبدأت رسالة تكنولوجية لوصول فني إلى العالم سوريا مباشرة بس نبعث عن طريق الأمين ووطنا اللي يخبر الجميع فني أحب أن أخبر العالم أن كل الأوطان جميلة Beyond music in the meantime. <laughs> All right, cool. Um, cool. Yeah. So, so in short, um, that was a, a video of one of the most recent pilots that we've done. Um, actually, we work with uh, Syrian artists as well, but we started with um, the, the artist villages I was working with over the years in India. And now we've created a way to expand that beyond India. And what we do is we work with um, indigenous and traditional communities generally living six to seven hours away from a tier three city. And we flattened their um, canvases, images, uh, even house wood carvings into two dimensional digital assets that get licensed. So if any of you guys are familiar with Shutterstock, um, a lot of ad and marketing agencies, they download stock images and they put it onto a landing page or they design a website with it. So that's a massive, massive market. And there's also an entire market that um, does the same for retail licensing. So the patterns on your shirt, that comes from a source image. And oftentimes, these designers are sourcing them from cultural indigenous communities. But so far, it's been massively mis mis uh, misappropriated. So what we're trying to do is connect those retail markets to the communities that we work with um, that are far away, but are the, uh, uh, are the producers of these incredible cultures and traditions. Um, Let's see. Oop. Yeah. That's supposed to be another video, but that's okay. It's not going to play. Um, <laughs> yeah. That's fine. Um, and what we started doing was we started setting up computers and scanners in these villages, and we started training these artists to scan in high resolution files of their designs. A lot of times in these communities, it's pretty remote, so it's not like you can upload a 300 megabyte file. So they'll store it on an external hard drive, and they'll mail it to one of our partners in Bangalore or, or, or in Mumbai, who will then upload it. 
and it will get accessible um, to anyone for downloading and use. Um, Yeah, sure, no problem. Um, it's a bit further down. That's all right. Let me just go down here. Yeah. Cool. And so till date, we've seen pieces that would have been sold for about 1,000 rupees, which is approximately the equivalent of 15 US dollars, uh, be sold and have a lifetime value of over $3,000 because it's being printed over and over again onto coasters, cards, tea towels. And the idea is that instead of just drawing something once, because there's this whole ecosystem built out for copyrights, we create ways for these artists to make a perpetual income stream from the artwork that they're producing. And this is massive as a multiplier for artists who have only seen potentially a few customers go by their village every single year. Uh, the whole vision behind this is to be able to create a way for these artists to get their art out without the same type of destruction that comes with culture tourism when people visit their homes and uh, take a lot of things from them or uh, change and affect the ability for them to be uh, living their own lifestyles. Cool. And so this is a, a, a short clip of um, an art form that a group of villagers actually ended up turning into a, an animation. And just shows you the potential of what uh, digitization of art can do because media licensing is a frequent thing in markets. Um, and part of the reason why we did this is because the folklore behind the artwork was so rich and I felt it was so, uh, it was so sad that it wasn't being captured and, and film and media was one way to do so. Yep. Yeah, so till date, uh, you know, <laughs> all of these, uh, the, the Root Studio as a social enterprise is, is an organization we, we have, you know, we have accountants, we have structures in place, um, but it all really kind of started from seeing something that's out there that there's a need, that there's a potential, and, and believing in just kind of changing this problem. I think there's a lot of easy, uh, I think there's a lot of talk about let's, you know, build a company, let's start some type of organization and structure, but it, it really is the other way around. Once you find something that you really believe in and you're passionate about, um, everything else in terms of raising money, uh, building a company, uh, bringing people onto the cause, that will come along uh, the lines of what you believe in and what you're passionate about. And till date, this is something that uh, we have now started moving beyond India, as you saw in the earlier video. Um, the communities that we work with in India are long existing partners who continue to submit artwork, but we also started expanding into Indonesia and the island of Sulawesi, uh, Jordan, and also in Panama. Uh, and until date, what we've seen is artwork on our platform has on average a 500% multiplier from what they were originally. Yep, so that was, yeah. Um, so I will pull up one more video before I end, but um, yeah, there's one more video I was gonna pull up. If we can go back to YouTube. <laughs> yeah, if we can go back to the browser, it's possible. I think while we're loading that up, um, there's so many, the, the last quote that was on the, um, the slide is, find the balance between the hubris of benevolence and the paralysis of cynicism. And that sounds like a lot of textbook jargon, um, but it is a, it's, it's a quote that actually really stuck out to me through uh, the seven year journey um, about doing this type of development work and also being a social entrepreneur, which is that as you move more and more towards international development and looking at these social issues, there's a lot of heartbreak that comes along the way and the myriad of problems just go deeper and deeper, whether it's the history and legacy of how poverty starts. Um, it can feel often overwhelming about what you can actually do and the, the type of role you can play. And the only thing you can do as a social entrepreneur is to always grapple and wrestle with yourself. You will never always have the right answers, even for what we do now, even though we have things in place, it's never, it's never an always right because one glove never fits all and every community has different types of practices. Um, oh, you can skip the video? Okay, cool. Yeah, I think, yeah, we're just gonna skip the last video. Um, but yeah, so I think in short, um, it's definitely though a social entrepreneurship, even in, in itself is a new space that uh, you as the next generation will be stepping in to define what it is. People in the industry, as corporates, as people in, in the, the social sector, and also in, in the government uh, cones, they're still also trying to grapple with what, what does the future of it look like? So you have a role in defining what it should be based on what you see and what you believe in. 
And uh, yeah, so that will be it because <laughs> I'm not able to pull over our video. But thank you very much.